So for the consensus layer, there would be like four incremental and gradual upgrades that would happen uh, before the the beam fork. Now I don't know where this like number like five to seven years came from because what I actually suggested in my in my uh, talk was a, a four year roadmap. So basically it would be from 2025 to 2029. Um, and uh, you know I've tried to be relatively realistic. Um, uh, you know as I mentioned a lot of preparation work uh, went uh, in this in this uh, in this proposal, talking to the various uh, uh, developers, and actually from the from the point of view of the developers, like four years, you know, uh, is like somewhat ambitious for such a, a big fork. Um, but yeah, I do I do acknowledge that the the community was disappointed by the by by the long long timelines, and hopefully four four years is a is a is a re realistic timeline. The other thing that I want to highlight is that Ethereum layer one is made out of these three different layers that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the podcast. There's the consensus layer, but there's also the data layer, and there's also the execution layer. And the data and execution layer are going to uh, evolve gradually as well. So for the data layer, um, it's basically all about increasing the bytes per second that we can push through Ethereum. Uh, and we have this notion of blobs, so the, these big data blobs. Um, and today we have a target of three blobs per slot. Uh, and the idea is to to grow that uh, roughly 40x to 128 blobs per slot uh, within the next uh, five years, call it. Um, and uh, this is this is known as uh, dank sharding. Um, and this is not going to happen in, 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 in one big uh, upgrade where we suddenly increase things by 40x. Instead, you should think of it as you know, maybe doubling by a factor of two every year, roughly speaking, until we get to that number. Um, and then on the execution side of things, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm very excited about is snarkifying the EVM. So there's a, a lot of uh, progress uh, within the industry on uh, what's called ZKVMs. Uh, so a ZKVM is uh, a piece of technology that allows essentially any developer in the world to make use of the power of SNARKs without having to be a SNARK expert or a cryptography expert. And in particular, you, um, the existing uh, execution client team, so that's you know, GEF and REF, uh, and 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 Bisu and, and various others, Aragon, um, that are not cryptography experts, uh, they can compile their code bases down to the zkVMs, and the zkVMs will do all of the heavy lifting on 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 their behalf. And once we've snarkified the the VM, we'll be in a position where we can do two things that are very exciting. The first thing is that we'll be able to increase the gas limit. And the reason is that the gas limit is there to protect the validators. But if the validators only have to verify these very, very cheap snark proofs, uh, they won't be exposed to this attack vector where someone provides a very big block with a lot of execution and they get overwhelmed by the amount of work that they have to do to, to validate the, the, the block. Um, and then the other uh, really interesting thing is something called native rollups. So once we've snarkified the EVM, we can expose uh, within the EVM a precompile that would allow anyone to deploy an exact copy of the EVM uh, on uh, as an L2 um, as a rollup, um, and so that would allow us to scale the EVM horizontally. Uh, so it, it's very reminiscent to what's called execution sharding, where you know uh, there was a proposal to have, for example, 64 copies of the EVM. Well, here with native rollups, we can have as many copies as, as the community wants. Um, and each copy can also be customized. So it can have its own uh, fee token. It can have its own governance mechanism. It can have its own sequencer, etc.